chapter 25, the Exodus. This chapter is based on Exodus 12, 34 to 51, and chapters 13 to 15. With their loins girt, with sandaled feet, and staff in hand, the people of Israel had stood, hushed, awed, yet expectant, awaiting the royal mandate that should bid them go forth. Before the morning broke, they were on their way. During the plagues, as the manifestation of God's power had kindled faith in the hearts of the bondmen and had struck terror to the oppressors, the Israelites had gradually assembled themselves in Goshen, and notwithstanding the suddenness of their flight, some provision had already been made for the necessary organization and control of the moving multitudes, they being divided into companies under appointed leaders. And they went out, about six hundred thousand on foot that were men beside children, and a mixed multitude went up also with them. In this multitude were not only those who were actuated by faith in the God of Israel, but also a far greater number who desired only to escape from the plagues, or who followed in the wake of the moving multitudes merely from excitement and curiosity. This class were ever a hindrance and a snare to Israel. The people took also with them flocks and herds, even very much cattle. These were the property of the Israelites, who had never sold their possessions to the king, as had the Egyptians. Jacob and his sons had brought their flocks and herds with them to Egypt, where they had greatly increased. Before leaving Egypt, the people, by the direction of Moses, claimed a recompense for their unpaid labor, and the Egyptians were too eager to be freed from their presence to refuse them. The bondmen went forth laden with the spoil of their oppressors. That day completed the history revealed to Abraham in prophetic vision centuries before. Thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. The four hundred years had been fulfilled, and it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. In their departure from Egypt, the Israelites bore with them a precious legacy in the bones of Joseph, which had so long awaited the fulfillment of God's promise, and which during the dark years of bondage had been a reminder of Israel's deliverance. Instead of pursuing the direct route to Canaan, which lay through the country of the Philistines, the Lord directed their course southward toward the shores of the Red Sea. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. Had they attempted to pass through Philistia, their progress would have been opposed. For the Philistines, regarding them as slaves escaping from their masters, would not have hesitated to make war upon them. The Israelites were poorly prepared for an encounter with that powerful and warlike people. They had little knowledge of God and little faith in Him, and they would have become terrified and disheartened. They were unarmed and unaccustomed to war. Their spirits were depressed by long bondage, and they were encumbered with women and children, flocks and herds. In leading them by the way of the Red Sea, the Lord revealed Himself as a God of compassion as well as of judgment. And they took their journey from Succoth, and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire, to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, from before the people. Says the psalmist, He spread a cloud for a covering, and fire to give light in the night. Psalm 105:39 See also 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 The standard of their invisible leader was ever with them by day the cloud directed their journeyings or spread as a canopy above the host it served as a protection from the burning heat and by its coolness and moisture afforded grateful refreshment in the parched thirsty desert by night it became a pillar of fire, illuminating their encampment and constantly assuring them of the divine presence. 
In one of the most beautiful and comforting passages of Isaiah's prophecy, reference is made to the pillar of cloud and of fire to represent God's care for his people in the great final struggle with the powers of evil. The Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For above all the glory shall be a covering, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, margin. Across a dreary, desert-like expanse they journeyed. Already they began to wonder whether their course would lead. They were becoming weary with the toilsome way, and in some hearts began to arise a fear of pursuit by the Egyptians. But the cloud went forward, and they followed. And now the Lord directed Moses to turn aside into a rocky defile, and encamp beside the sea. It was revealed to him that Pharaoh would pursue them, but that God would be honored in their deliverance. In Egypt the report was spread that the children of Israel, instead of tarrying to worship in the desert, were pressing on toward the Red Sea. Pharaoh's counselors declared to the king that their bondmen had fled, never to return. The people deplored their folly in attributing the death of the firstborn to the power of God. Their great men, recovering from their fears, accounted for the plagues as the result of natural causes. Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? was the bitter cry. Pharaoh collected his forces, six hundred chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, horsemen, captains, and foot soldiers. The king himself, attended by the great men of his realm, headed the attacking army. To secure the favor of the gods, and thus ensure the success of their undertaking, the priests also accompanied them. The king was resolved to intimidate the Israelites by a grand display of his power. The Egyptians feared, lest their forced submission to the God of Israel should subject them to the derision of other nations. But if they should now go forth with a great show of power and bring back the fugitives, they would redeem their glory as well as recover the services of their bondmen. The Hebrews were encamped beside the sea, whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them, while on the south a rugged mountain obstructed their further progress. Suddenly they beheld in the distance the flashing armor and moving chariots betokening the advance guard of a great army. As the force drew nearer, the hosts of Egypt were seen in full pursuit. Terror filled the hearts of Israel. Some cried unto the Lord, but far the greater part hastened to Moses with their complaints. Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses was greatly troubled that his people should manifest so little faith in God. Notwithstanding, they had repeatedly witnessed the manifestation of his power in their behalf. How could they charge upon him the dangers and difficulties of their situation when he had followed the express command of God? True, there was no possibility of deliverance unless God himself should interpose for their release. But, having been brought into this position in obedience to the divine direction, Moses felt no fear of the consequences. His calm and assuring reply to the people was, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. It was not an easy thing to hold the hosts of Israel in waiting before the Lord. Lacking discipline and self-control, they became violent and unreasonable. They expected speedily to fall into the hands of their oppressors, and their wailings and lamentations were loud and deep. The wonderful pillar of cloud had been followed as a signal of God to go forward, but now they questioned among themselves if it might not foreshadow some great calamity. For had it not led them on the wrong side of the mountain, into an impassable way? Thus the angel of God appeared to their deluded minds as a harbinger of disaster. 
But now, as the Egyptian host approached them, expecting to make them an easy prey, the cloudy column rose majestically into the heavens, passed over the Israelites, and descended between them and the armies of Egypt. A wall of darkness interposed between the pursued and their pursuers. The Egyptians could no longer discern the camp of the Hebrews and were forced to halt. But as the darkness of night deepened, the wall of cloud became a great light to the Hebrews, flooding the entire encampment with the radiance of day. Then hope returned to the hearts of Israel, and Moses lifted up his voice unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. The psalmist, describing the passage of the sea by Israel, sang, Thy way was in the sea, and thy paths in the great waters, and thy footsteps were not known. Thou leddest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Psalm 77, verses 19 and 20 in the Revised Version. As Moses stretched out his rod, the waters parted and Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, while the water stood like a wall upon each side. The light from God's pillar of fire shone upon the foam-capped billows, and lighted the road that was cut like a mighty furrow through the waters of the sea, and was lost in the obscurity of the farther shore. The Egyptians pursued, and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians. The mysterious cloud changed to a pillar of fire before their astonished eyes. The thunders pealed and the lightnings flashed. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightning lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Psalm 77, verses 17 and 18, Revised Version. The Egyptians were seized with confusion and dismay. Amid the wrath of the elements in which they heard the voice of an angry god, they endeavored to retrace their steps and flee to the shore they had quitted. But Moses stretched out his rod, and the piled-up waters hissing, roaring, and eager for their prey, rushed together and swallowed the Egyptian army in their black depths. As morning broke, it revealed to the multitudes of Israel all that remained of their mighty foes, the mail-clad bodies cast upon the shore. From the most terrible peril, one night had brought complete deliverance. That vast, helpless throng, bondmen unused to battle, women, children, and cattle, with the sea before them and the mighty armies of Egypt pressing behind, had seen their path opened through the waters and their enemies overwhelmed in the moment of expected triumph. Jehovah alone had brought them deliverance, and to him their hearts were turned in gratitude and faith. Their emotion found utterance in songs of praise. The Spirit of God rested upon Moses, and he led the people in a triumphant anthem of thanksgiving, the earliest and one of the most sublime that are known to man. I will sing unto Jehovah, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he is become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. Jehovah is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea, and his chosen captains are sunk in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, dasheth in pieces the enemy. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou in thy mercy hast led the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength to thy holy habitation. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Terror and dread falleth upon them. By the greatness of thine arm they are as still as a stone. 
till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in, and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. Exodus chapter 15, the first 16 verses in the Revised Version. Like the voice of the great deep rose from the vast host of Israel that sublime ascription. It was taken up by the women of Israel, Miriam, the sister of Moses, leading the way as they went forth with timbrel and dance. Far over desert and sea rang the joyous refrain, and the mountains re-echoed the words of their praise, Sing ye to Jehovah, for he hath triumphed gloriously. This song and the great deliverance which it commemorates made an impression never to be effaced from the memory of the Hebrew people. From age to age it was echoed by the prophets and singers of Israel, testifying that Jehovah is the strength and deliverance of those who trust in him. That song does not belong to the Jewish people alone. It points forward to the destruction of all the foes of righteousness and the final victory of the Israel of God. The prophet of Patmos beholds the white-robed multitude that have gotten the victory, standing on the sea of glass mingled with fire, having the harps of God, and they sing the songs of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Psalm 115, verse 1. Such was the spirit that pervaded Israel's song of deliverance, and it is a spirit that should dwell in the hearts of all who love and fear God. In freeing our souls from the bondage of sin, God has wrought for us a deliverance greater than that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Like the Hebrew host, we should praise the Lord with heart and soul and voice for his wonderful works to the children of men. Those who dwell upon God's great mercies and are not unmindful of his lesser gifts will put on the girdle of gladness and make melody in their hearts to the Lord. The daily blessings that we receive from the hand of God and above all else the death of Jesus to bring happiness and heaven within our reach should be a theme for constant gratitude. What compassion! What matchless love has God shown to us, lost sinners, in connecting us with himself, to be to him a peculiar treasure? What a sacrifice has been made by our Redeemer that we may be called children of God. We should praise God for the blessed hope held out before us in the great plan of redemption. We should praise him for the heavenly inheritance and for his rich promises. Praise him that Jesus lives to intercede for us. Whoso offereth praise, says the Creator, glorifieth me. Psalm 50, verse 23. All the inhabitants of heaven unite in praising God. Let us learn the song of the angels now, that we may sing it when we join their shining ranks. Let us say with the psalmist, While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. Psalm 146, verse 2, and Psalm 67, verse 5. God in his providence brought the Hebrews into the mountain fastnesses before the sea, that he might manifest his power in their deliverance, and signally humble the pride of their oppressors. He might have saved them in any other way but he chose this method in order to test their faith and strengthen their trust in him. The people were weary and terrified, yet if they had held back when Moses bade them advance, God would never have opened the path for them. It was by faith that they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 29. In marching down to the very water, they showed that they believed the word of God as spoken by Moses. They did all that it was in their power to do, and then the mighty one of Israel divided the sea to make a path for their feet. The great lesson here taught is for all time. Often the Christian life is beset by dangers, and duty seems hard to perform. The imagination pictures impending ruin before, and bondage or death behind. Yet, the voice of God speaks clearly, Go forward. We should obey this command. 
even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness and we feel the cold waves about our feet. The obstacles that hinder our progress will never disappear before a halting, doubting spirit. Those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey at all. Unbelief whispers, let us wait till the obstructions are removed and we can see our way clearly. But faith courageously urges an advance, hoping all things, believing all things. The cloud that was a wall of darkness to the Egyptians was to the Hebrews a great flood of light, illuminating the whole camp and shedding brightness upon the path before them. So the dealings of providence bring to the unbelieving darkness and despair, while to the trusting soul they are full of light and peace. The path where God leads the way may lie through the desert or the sea, but it is a safe path.